morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. My name is Jennifer Juarez, and I uh, am a member here at Eighth Church. Um, this morning, we are going to welcome Melanie Wahlberg, and she's a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship and a Christian Science Practitioner. Melanie grew up in Michigan, learning little by little how reliable prayer could be, especially once she was on her own in college. After finishing a doctorate in mathematics, she became a college professor and truly enjoyed teaching her students about new mathematical ideas. But more and more, when students came to her office for help, she found herself talking with them about the excitement of growing spiritually. After the calculus was done, of course. After just two years at the college, she resigned her position and began accepting calls as a Christian science practitioner. These days, she works from her home office in Los Angeles with her husband, who is also a practitioner, and their three grown children. And she gets to see lives transformed by the healing ideas of Christian science. Let's give Melody a warm welcome. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Jennifer. That was perfect. Sometimes the introducer does such a good job, you just want them to keep going. <laughs> but it is just really a joy to be with you all. It, the, the novelty of being together in person still has not worn off for me. It's still really joyful to, to all be together. So we're talking today about giving freely of ourselves. You know, what that, what that means even. I'll, I'll talk about that, what that looks like and how we all gain. And I'll tell you why that's become a, a focus of mine. You know, we all have areas in our life that could use some help, you know, on a personal level or in the community. Um, my Uber driver yesterday, we had a great conversation about um, the, the Houston community. He used to be the, some, I, I don't know his title exactly, but something like the director of Houston Jail Chaplain Ministry. And so he had all kinds of great ideas about, you know, I mean, very spiritual ideas that, that would contribute to uh, uplifting people's lives in a permanent way. And we, we really enjoyed talking together about that. And, you know, the, the world is reaching out for solutions. Um, and, and ideas come through, you know, I, and especially... We're especially looking for solutions to things that um, are important to us, you know, the big stuff, I mean, like our health or um, our professional lives and careers, relationships, particularly when what we've tried so far hasn't been as successful as we'd like, and, and I know what that feels like. But I'm also learning a little bit more of what truly brings progress. And so today I want to talk about an unexpected way forward, a way forward that I found that was, that was different than I thought it was going to be, unexpected to the world, maybe. Um, the ideas in Christian science, this is a talk on Christian science, and the, the approach that I'm talking about today have transformed my life. But they've transformed the lives of people around me as well, I think, sometimes without their even being aware of it. Giving freely of ourselves touches the world. I know that sounds big. <laughs> it is big. That's what we'll be talking about today. And you know, for those of you that are thinking, um, I wasn't really looking for a whole new experience here. You know, I was kind of thinking about comfort and healing. Please know that you've come to the right place too, because the ideas that, that we'll be talking about today really are the basis of comfort and healing. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I want to start by jumping into a story about, well, it's about this. It's about a, a fellow who kind of reluctantly at first, I think, found it within himself to give freely and how that blessed himself and his family and those around him unexpectedly. So he was a junior in high school, this, this guy, and had struggled for several days with a sore jaw and swollen face, um, his teeth hurt, his wisdom teeth were coming in, but not in a comfortable way. Uh, in fact, it was difficult for him to eat properly. He was getting by on smoothies and ice cream and stuff like that, and stoicism. Stoicism, because he wasn't really letting anybody help him, especially his parents. 
Um, he was going to get through this himself. Now, this kid had had some experience in turning to prayer, turning to God, particularly when things were difficult, and finding healing. His parents were Christian scientists, and so that was what their family did. And so one evening, when the discomfort was pretty noticeable, he decided to go up to his room and think about how he wanted to go forward. And he could hear the whole family downstairs making dinner together, you know, and he thought, okay, no more stoicism. I'm going to reach out for some help here. And so he called a practitioner of Christian science and asked her if she'd pray for him. And a practitioner of Christian science is somebody like me whose full-time job is taking prayer requests and responding with Christian science treatment and, and with healing. And the, the prayer element of Christian science treatment doesn't have any physical component to it. It's, you know, there's no laying of hands or touching or anything like that. It's, it's communing with God. That's what it is, communing with God in a way that moves our thought, you know, in a way that aligns our thought with reality. And that, that mental activity, of course, transforms our outlook, and that transforms our experience. And that was just the type of thing this kid was looking for. So the practitioner agreed to pray for him, and then they just chatted for a little bit. And he mentioned in their conversation that he was in the process of buying a new motorcycle. He was really excited about this. He could not wait, really proud of the bike that he picked out and, and really excited for this new chapter of independence and freedom and manhood. His parents were not so excited. Uh, they, were, they were concerned about his safety. You know, he was 16 or so. So the practitioner just said one thing to him. She said, is getting the motorcycle right now worth a conflict with your parents? Not get the bike as soon as possible? Okay, that was a new idea to him. But I think something in either the way that she had been praying earlier that day or something in their conversation had kind of softened his heart or softened his outlook because as he started thinking about it, he realized yeah, this, this was something he could do. He could graduate high school, move out, you know, wait a year or two, and then buy the motorcycle. And he tells me that when he came to that conclusion, he actually felt relieved. So the two of them finish their conversation, he hangs up the phone, and he realizes in that moment that all the symptoms are gone. The swelling that had been distorting his face for days was instantly gone. The pain was gone. His teeth felt great. He went downstairs and had a nice normal dinner with his family, first time in days. And over the next several weeks, his wisdom teeth came in just naturally and normally, comfortably. He still has them today. And, you know, the motorcycle came along at just the right time, too. That decision that he made to do the bigger thing, you know, he wasn't thinking of himself when he decided not to buy the motorcycle. He was thinking, what's going to make my household run better? What's going to honor my parents? He probably wouldn't have used those words. But that's the type of bigger thinking that he was doing. When he made that decision, he didn't lose anything good at all. Just the opposite. You know, he, he gained. He gained relief, joy. Um, probably a better relationship with his parents. I mean, I think they found more mutual respect for one another. I think he found more freedom and, and even manhood in that decision. You know, he kind of put himself on a level with his parents when he did that. I think he found more maturity in that than he might have in the bike. And he found remarkable, quick healing. I, you know, I would say he found that unexpected way forward. And so I want to talk about this phenomenon of giving freely of ourselves and what we all gain. You know, I think anytime we find ourselves in a situation like that, feeling stuck, um, you know, and it could be something physical, but, or it could be, you know, you lost your job or went through a breakup or something like that. And anytime we're in that situation, 
I have found, and I'm still learning this, but it seems like what really can make a difference is that humility that the kid showed, or even sacrifice. Bear with me on the word sacrifice. I know that word's not always popular. But sacrifice can be oddly rewarding because it shows us that our happiness is not as dependent on the thing we want or, you know, the thing that we're giving up as we thought it was. And, and I know the world doesn't necessarily know this or, or send this message. If you're stuck and you, uh, you know, Google an answer, if you look online and say, like, what should I do? The, the, the internet is probably not going to advocate for give more of yourself or sacrifice or something like that. That's why I call it an unexpected way forward. But, but I find that, you know, anytime we feel stuck, there's a larger context that we can find, you know, or a higher perspective, like the kid did, that has healing solutions in it. But I can't talk about those healing solutions or, or the larger context without talking about God. And so that's where I want to start. We'll talk about God and God's nature and us and our nature. And we'll look at prayer. Prayer is such a catalyst for good in our lives. And then I want to talk about Jesus a little bit. Um, probably our best example of somebody giving freely of himself. And then we'll look at some modern day examples of, of people doing this. So I, I mentioned I, I am a Christian science practitioner, and my job, just the demands of, of the, the daily work, I think, just impel me to keep finding a different, deeper, not different, keep finding a deeper understanding of God and prayer. And I'm sure many of you are always trying to do this too. Um, I've found that it's, it's really important that I not kind of relegate God to the role of superhuman that feels kind of distant in our everyday lives. You know, and, and if you feel yourself doing that, the Bible is a really good antidote. Um, because the Bible, particularly the New Testament, puts forward a view of God as divine love. You know, not a superhuman, but a presence. I think that's the difference. Not, not something that judges or condemns or withholds or something like that, but something that encourages, a presence that, that welcomes. The Bible talks about God being, yeah, a very present help in trouble. Um, we can also think of God as infinite spirit, you know, that, that animates us and that, that creates the universe, that works on our behalf. And when you start doing that, when you start thinking of God as this presence, infinite love or divine spirit, you start seeing, okay, this is what impels every good thing. This is the animating intelligence of the universe. It's, it's God as spirit, God as infinite love that helps us discover within ourselves what we most need. You know, I mean, that helps us discover um, joy and harmony and, and health, unity. So that's a little something of the infinite loving nature of God. And I'll, I'll circle back to that probably more than once as we speak. I feel like, I think the world's tendency is to make God small or, or human-like, you know? And, and so every time I go back and expand my understanding of God. It kind of invigorates all my other thoughts. So I like doing that. Uh, okay, so then what about us and, and our nature? I mean, I think that's something that people have thought about forever, practically. You know, they talk about it in the Bible. In Psalms, we're referred to in terms of God. That's why I wanted to start with God. Um, in, yeah, in the Old Testament book of Psalms, it says, it is God that hath made us not we ourselves. We are God's people. We are people of divine love, or people of infinite spirit. That is, I love the sound of that. It's really cool. And it gives you something really substantial to think about. And you probably already have. 
I mean, chances are you've thought about or at least wondered if, if your core identity isn't so much more than what we see on the surface. I mean, even for all that you, know, you see on social media that's very superficially oriented, I think we know intuitively that we're so much more than something physical, you know, that eats and breathes and tries not to get sick. If we're God's people, if we're people of infinite spirit or people of divine love, then we're like God. You know, just like works of art are like the, the artist that made them. Works of art show the nature and essence of the artist. We show the nature and essence of God. You know, we're, we're naturally kind and wise and capable. Capable, I love that. We're, we're capable of loving our neighbor, even when it seems difficult. Or, or capable of trying something new and being good at it the first time. I mean, that... Maybe the world doesn't say that, but that possibility is built into us. And, and that's the reality of the universe, you know, uh, qualities of God being expressed without limitation. And prayer shows us that good reality. You know, I talked earlier about this guy who found some nice inspiration and healing, I mean, you know, tangible healing, when he turned to prayer. What was going on there? Or how can we do that? That's really what I'm asking. Uh, there are a lot of ways to pray. There, there's many ways to pray as there are people in Houston, I'm sure. But I think one thing that's kind of common to any sincere prayer is just this, this deep childlike desire to be more aware of God in our lives. I mean, that's what we want to feel it, you know, to, to feel welcomed by divine love or to feel, to feel informed by infinite mind. I and mean, wouldn't you love getting your ideas from infinite mind? To feel um, animated by, by spirit, by spirit itself. That kind of prayer, you know, where you're communing with God, like I was talking about at the beginning, Truly feeling God's presence that way is transformative. You know, it, um, it shows us more of mm, who we are. That's it, I think. You know, when, when you feel that presence of God, you can't help but discover more of your own nature. If God is divine spirit... And, and spirit made everything, then that means that everything in the universe, including us, is inherently spiritual. I know that's a really big statement. We could spend the rest of the day talking about you know, what it means to be spiritual. But one, one thing I can immediately state is that means that there's nothing incomplete or limiting or, or limited built into us. You know, as, as I said, we're, we're, able, we're capable of expressing all the qualities of God without limitation. And I think when you realize more of God's infinite loving nature, you, you realize that again about yourself. You rediscover your spiritual nature. And I find in those moments, that can't help but make my prayer bigger. You know, my goals change. And whatever pushed me to pray in the first place, you know, whatever problem or argument or worry or, or desire or something like that, whatever kind of impelled me into the prayer chair, can now kind of take a back seat to the larger ideas that are coming to me from God. That, that, that is, yeah, that's transformative. I mean, you end up praying about something different than you thought you were going to, you know? And you get these big ideas. I mean, that transformative prayer starts with ideas about God and God's nature and us, and our nature, and then our agreeing with those ideas. I mean, that is the stuff of prayer. I feel like I've really been doing that the last week or two, just thinking about, okay, th these ideas are coming to me from God, and I have a choice. I mean, in this moment, I can agree with it a little bit more, agreeing with the ideas. And then that, that uplifted outlook that we all get isn't something that you're trying to make happen. 
it's reality. It's reality, and you're aligned with it, and then you experience it. I mean, I might, in prayer, discover, or I should say rediscover, I think, that as an expression of God, I'm just innately joyful and purposeful. Ideas like that land really well when they come to us in prayer. Even if you're not feeling joyful and purposeful right in the moment, when divine love sends us ideas like that, they, they ring true. Because, like I said, you experience them. I might, you know, after communing with God and, and getting that inspiration about joy and, and purpose and my innate joy and purpose, I might the next morning, without even trying, wake up an hour earlier than usual and get everything done more joyfully and more purposefully than I thought I could. And sometimes I don't connect the dots with that, but it's really fun when you do, you know, and realize where this good is coming from. And that's the type of thing we can expect when we turn to prayer. But prayer isn't about changing things. You know, prayer is discovery. It's discovering the reality that God is bringing out in us and recognizing that that reality is true for everybody. That's how it impacts the community, I think. That can then grow into um, just a, a larger sense that, that includes the whole community, blesses everybody, or that brings physical healing to somebody in need. Prayer shows us that larger context of God that includes everybody. So let's talk about somebody who consistently lived in that larger context that I'm talking about. That would be all of us, actually, now that I think about it, but somebody who is consistently aware of it. Someone who saw humility and moral courage and good works as, as just a way of life, as a way of moving forward everybody and everything, not just himself. And you probably know I'm talking about Jesus. I think because of, well, yeah, his healing works alone. I mean, feeding huge groups of people with small amounts of food, or what looked like a small amount of food. Um, curing disease that was considered incurable, or permanently transforming character. Because of just, just that aspect of his ministry, Jesus stands out as probably the best example that we have of somebody giving freely of himself. And, and that's why I want to talk about him today. Jesus' example and especially his, his teachings, I think, show us the value and, and the reward, too, of giving freely of ourselves. He, he shows us what to do, and that we're better at it than we realize. Even if we feel stuck. You know, I think sometimes when, when we feel stuck, and I talked about this earlier at the beginning, we feel like, you know, and there's lots of ways to feel stuck, like I said, unemployed or not feeling well or sad or whatever. Um, when we feel one of those ways, it, sometimes it can feel like, okay, the best thing I can do today is just get through the day. You know, I mean, stay under the radar, tread water. Maybe somebody else will do something. Or maybe my circumstances will change. But Jesus showed us that even in circumstances like that, the ball is in our court so much more than we realize. You know, he, maybe especially in circumstances like that. Jesus showed us a way forward and, and that we're good at it. And it really has to do with love. And by love, I mean maybe a little more expansive sense of love, love that steps up to the plate in a new way. You know, love that does something new and unexpected. Jesus had a unique relationship with God. I mean, he saw everything in terms of God and what God was doing, or divine love. Let me, let me put it in terms of love. Jesus saw everything in terms of divine love and what divine love was enabling. And because of that, he was always learning more about the healing power of divine love and wanting all of us to experience it as much as possible. There's this scene where he's talking to his disciples, and he tells them, if they can love one another as he did, even when it seems difficult, they'll find reliable joy. I'm sure it was hard to be a disciple sometimes, and especially get along with the other disciples. I mean, it's like you have 11 siblings that, you know, <laughs> that you're trying to get along with. 
But if they could do that, if they could find it within themselves to give more and love one another, they'd find this reliable joy that totally tracks with what I'm talking about today. Our joy comes from contributing to the good that's going on. There are a lot of ways to do this. I mean, not everybody's going to wait two years and then buy a motorcycle. You know, that was, that was the right way forward for the guy that I talked about first. But I have found that when we're really yearning for healing, you know, for ourselves or, or for somebody else, and we get quiet, maybe pray in some of the ways that I've talked about already, there often comes this, I would say, unexpected nudge from divine love about how we might give more of ourselves. And, and you know, like I said, it's not, not the world's way and it's a quiet voice. It's a nudge. It's not a command. I don't think it's, a, it's an invitation. There's so many ways that that can happen. There, there's so many ways that we can be nudged. I mean, for, for one person, it might be taking on an assignment at work that you felt kind of intimidated by. You know, maybe your boss thinks you're ready for it, but it sounds hard. You know, being willing to take that on and and see how you can grow into it, see what you can contribute unexpectedly. Um, for somebody else, maybe many of us, it could be about forgiveness. How am I doing with the mic, by the way? Is it, it seems great, okay. And I also, I should have said at the beginning, sometimes when I'm excited about or inspired, I talk too fast. How's the pace? Okay, great, you guys are dear. If, if, sometimes when my husband's in the audience, he'll go, like that to me to like help me slow down. So you feel free to do that. It won't bother me. But so I was talking about different ways that we can be nudged to love more, love our community more, just love ourselves or everybody more. Um, and for some of us, that could be forgiveness. You know, maybe there's somebody in your past that, you know, did something that felt hurtful. Maybe you haven't even thought about them for a while, you know thinking of them, forgiving them, and even supporting them going forward. When you forgive somebody, you are giving freely of yourself. And a lot of times, you're the only one that can do that for that person, you know, or at least in that particular context. I mean, you have the, the most ability to, to really give. Um, what else? It could be... It could be finding the moral courage to... Share a testimony of healing with a friend that you hardly ever talk to about God. You know, maybe being willing to go there. And you'll know if it feels right, if it feels awkward, maybe that's not the time. But, but there are times when there just seems to be a little opportunity and taking that opportunity to share some ideas that were spiritual and helpful. So, you know, sometimes it's the moral courage to talk a little bit more. Sometimes it's the courage or the humility to talk less. You know, sometimes that's how we give of ourselves, talk less and let others shine. Um, another way, <laughs> this is difficult for me, is finding it within ourselves to encourage somebody else to talk less. You know, and that could be like at a meeting or in your family or something like that. And you have to listen to God on that one. But I mean, I'm finding, you know, that there are lots of ways that we can step up a little bit more in a very humble way and give of ourselves. Well, all of those ways that I just talked about, all of those ways of giving come from divine love. And so they bring joy. I mean, certainly they bring joy to the one loving and giving. Um, I mean, they certainly bring joy to everybody around them. But what I'm discovering is they bring joy to the giver, too. That, that's what's new to me. I think that's what's somewhat new to me. And I think that's the essence of the message today. We're not giving in order to get something from somebody or from the world. You know, that kind of transactional giving doesn't bring unexpected joy and healing and, and momentum. You're just kind of doing what the world thought you were going to do, and so that just kind of keeps going. It doesn't do something unexpected. But when we give freely of ourselves, that's when things get really interesting. You know, it, it's not that you're getting something as much as you're discovering what's already here. You know, you're discovering the, well, the love and the, the abundance, the, 
the intelligence, the energy, the health that's here already, like the kid did. You know, you're finding that larger context of God that has healing solutions in it. You're, you're seeing that life is bigger and better than you realized. And you have something to contribute to it. You're, you're a big part of that. I think, who wouldn't want that? And then anything that's unlike God, like a sore jaw or a breakup or, you know, grief or pain or injury, anything like that, loses its grip. You know, it's, it's just not part of this larger context that we inhabit. And it's my understanding that Jesus understood that and experienced it and, and taught it. We're not all going to do it like Jesus did, but I think anytime we're willing to let go of some trait that was never really part of us, that was never really from God, you know, like holding a grudge or um, stage fright or, you know, just being disagreeable, anything like that, we understand a little bit better Jesus' example. I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, I am come that they might have life and that they have it more abundantly. That, that's the abundant living. You know, abundance isn't about accumulating stuff. It's about discovery. Discovering the good that God is bringing out in us and letting that impel us forward to do something big and good in the world. Like the Uber driver do something good and big in the world, or at least in our corner of the world. I think that sounds good to all of us, and, and I'm sure many of us are doing that to some degree. The, the only thing that would prevent us from doing it more, well, is that, if I'm honest, I have to say it, it can start with some tough moments. Not because what we're giving up is all that, or what we're agreeing to do is too hard for us. I mean, neither of those is true. But it can start with some tough moments because what we're really giving up is an old view. I think that's it, giving up an old view of ourselves or our neighbor or the world that has somehow come to seem important to us, or at least entrenched, you know. But those, those outgrown views only seem rock solid until you test them a little bit and realize that they're not. You know, like the kid did. I mean, I, I don't know how he quite did it, but when he crossed that line and decided that he could wait to buy the thing he really wanted, he felt relieved. You know, I mean, there's good stuff on the other side of yielding like that or the humility that it takes. So when we, when we do that, When we give up that old view, yeah, we discover that it never was rock solid, and then we're freed up to experience and enjoy the good that just makes our hearts sing. <laughs> and, and again, it's a little different for everybody, but you know when you're feeling it. I mean, you, you know when you feel that energy and momentum lead you forward. And that, that momentum is not something you're creating. You know, you can tell. You're just swept up in it. it it's, it's God. It's, it's tangible evidence of God in our lives. And it comes to us in the form of ideas and inspiration and even physical health, physical well-being, strength. You end up being able to do something you didn't realize you could. That presence, that, that active proof of God's care for us has a really special name, and it's Christ. And that's... Um, the healing, loving activity of God working on our behalf. And that Christ presence just shown in Jesus' life, in his, his consciousness and so his experience. And he was known by the title Christ because of the way that he uniquely proved this, or strongly proved this, the way he strongly, consistently proved this presence of God with us. And the Christ presence is... Timeless, too. I mean, you, you certainly see evidence of it in, in Jesus' healing ministry, but in, in the Hebrew scriptures as well. And even today, in 2023, this Christ presence is here bringing mental clarity and reassurance, solutions, 
to today's issues. In fact, it says in the New Testament, we continue to share in all that Christ has for us. I love that. Somebody who showed that we continue to share in all that Christ has for us in a really practical way was Mary Baker Eddy. She was a spiritual seeker, eventually a religious reformer, who was born in 1821 to a devout Christian family in New England, to parents who loved the Bible. They loved and quoted and often read the Bible to their kids. And so Mary and her five siblings just grew up in this atmosphere of spiritual discovery and Bible debate, Bible reading, church going, and prayer. And in all of that, in her youth and in her young adulthood, she discovered something of the, the healing power of God-centered living. And that probably sounds pretty intuitive to us today. I mean, I think that connection has become a lot stronger in the thought of society. But it was fairly new at her, at her point in time to connect physical well-being with you know, your God-fearing Christian practice. So that was, that was something new there. Um, then as an adult, her prayers, which had been growing over the decades, her relationship with God, lifted her out of chronic ill health. I mean, it had that major impact on her, decades of chronic ill health, and it healed some acute injuries that were thought to be life-threatening. And so I'm kind of telescoping events in her life, but you can tell there was a lot going on here. And it was during this time that she discovered what she referred to as Christian science. That is an explanation of God's nature. We've, we've touched on that a little bit. Um, an explanation of our nature as expressions of God. Christian science shows the, the unbreakable connection we each have with divine love. And I have found practicing Christian science, little by little, you know, to the best I can, has brought me um, an experience with God that's just, I'm more aware of that, that presence. I'm more aware of God's loving presence, healing presence. And it's a presence that necessarily includes physical healing for ourselves and for those around us. You might say, how does that work? I used the phrase spiritual seeker earlier, um, and, and I'll get more into that. Um, it turns out that in, in Christ Jesus ministry, in Christ Jesus' healing ministry, at which many people were seeking and following, there is a, a reliable method behind his healing work. There's a science there to be discerned and, and experienced. And when Mary Baker Eddy discovered that science, she found that she was able to heal herself and others of all kinds of chronic and acute disease. And of course, that had a huge impact on her. I mean, it was certainly impacting those around her. But I mean, when she discovered the potential, the healing potential of this science, it became her life mission to share it as widely as possible um, from then on. And so she started just very innocently. She, she wanted to get the word out. She went to the local Christian churches in her town, talking to the pastors and ministers um, and explaining this Christian healing principle to them, totally expecting that they would start preaching it from their pulpits. And when that didn't happen, she realized that if she was going to get the word out, she was going to have to write it and, and publish it. And so she did in her book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures. I'm so glad she did that. I, I am so grateful that she not only discovered this healing method that Christ Jesus had been practicing centuries earlier, but also that she wrestled with it and, and practiced it and made it her own so that she could articulate the ideas in a way that would last. This is a little cliched to say, but the, the, ideas, in Christian, the ideas in science and health have changed my life. You know? And I think what I'll say just for now is that they've shown me a better identity within myself than I thought I could find. You know, I mean, it turns out that I'm less afraid than I thought I was, and maybe more capable than I realized. And that's the type of experience that readers have with science and health. We, we find those, those qualities that 
uplift our lives, that we're always there, you know, that we're always within, and that when we find them. So as you can imagine, demand for her book grew, and interest in her, her reputation as a healer, grew. And as a result, many people have written biographies of Mary Baker Eddy, and there's an anecdote in one of those that I want to share. And it has to do with what we're talking about today. Again, it was this, this guy who kind of reluctantly, at first, found it within himself to give freely of himself, and then how that impacted just widening circles, himself, his family, his community, for decades to come. So let's see, Mary Baker Eddy discovers Christian science in the 1860s, and from then on just gives her life over to, to again, sharing the ideas with the community. She mostly does this through healing, um, but it's healing, teaching, preaching, and writing and publishing her book. But by the end of the century, she's really focused here on teaching classes and publishing her book because the healing work by this time is mostly done by a, a rising generation of healers, her students. But at the same time, there is this uh, sea captain, Joseph Eastman is his name, in, also in New England, who had just returned from a sea voyage, an international voyage, to find his bedridden wife in, in worse shape than ever. I mean, he's really concerned for her health. He's concerned for her life, really. He has just heard of Mary Baker Eddy, though, this, this New England woman who is practicing a revived Christian healing, taking prayer requests and responding in real time. And so he goes to her door, <laughs> goes right to her house, knocks on the door, and she answers, and he asks if she'll heal his wife. To his astonishment, she says to him, and she does this with just this heart full of love and respect. She says, Captain Eastman, why don't you heal your wife yourself? He was not expecting that. I mean, remember, he had just heard of Christian science. He had just heard of Mary Baker Eddy. But I think she realized that if Eastman wanted to be part of the healing work, you know, he wanted to be involved in this. That was going to do more for him and the healing activity in his life and family and maybe even community than if she took the case herself. Something like, you know, what is it? Teaching, giving somebody a fish versus teaching them to fish. She wanted to teach him to fish. So she was actually about to start teaching a class on, on Christian healing. And so she invited Captain Eastman to enroll in it, which he did. He began praying for his wife, who improved until a full recovery took place. And, you know, Mrs. Eastman at this point is so impressed, so touched, just feels so loved by, by the healing that she then enrolls in a class with Mary Baker Eddy on spiritual healing. And eventually both husband and wife become Christian science practitioners. And, you know, what had been this concerned husband and his invalid wife became this you know, power couple that helped and healed in their community for, for decades to come. I think Mrs. Eastman found healing when Captain Eastman discovered that there was this reliable scientific healing method, timeless, universal, that he and anybody could practice. I'm sure that was a kind of big moment for him. I mean, I think that probably took a lot of moral courage for him to kind of admit the universal nature of, of Christian science. It, you know, it would have been easier for him to let Mary Baker Eddy take the case, or it would have seemed easier at least. But Eastman, like all of us, had something awesome inside, something God-derived, that his circumstances were demanding. And Christian science showed him that. I mean, showed him that life was bigger and better than he realized, and he had something to contribute to it. And we all do. It really has to do with discovering the potential that a person can have on the whole world. Mary Baker Eddy talks about this a little bit in one of her books. Um, there's a passage, and she's speaking rhetorically. She says, who should care for everybody? It's enough, say they, to care for a few. But the good done and the love that foresees more to do stimulate philanthropy. 
and are an ever-present reward. I love that idea of stimulating philanthropy. I mean, that's like the, the rising tide that lifts all boats. You know, when you see somebody do something unexpectedly generous, like at the grocery store or something, you don't feel jealous of them. Or so you just think, oh, I want to do that. You know, I mean, you want to be part of that, that good. You know, it's, it's, um, it's universal. Like I said, it lifts all of us. When we find our lives in that, that activity of love, that love that foresees more to do, we find that ever-present reward. That, that's what I didn't know three years ago. You know, I sometimes say I couldn't have given this lecture three years ago. I just, I didn't know this unexpected reward. But, but we find it in this giving of ourselves. And it's so joyful. It's so unexpectedly fun and <laughs> joyful. And I'm not, you know, I'm not looking with rose-colored glasses. Like I said, I know it can start with some tough moments, but there's really good stuff on the other side. When we find that unexpected reward and the joy that's in it, I find that that feeling you know, when we step out of ourselves a little bit and, and see the picture and, and contribute like we can, that feeling kind of eclipses any feeling of needing or wanting something ourselves. You know, and, and it's not that you don't get what you need because we absolutely do and more as our motorcycle friend showed, but you've kind of gotten over yourself. You know, you've gotten over yourself and now your life is just impelled forward by divine love. And, you know, in a, in a modest way, the motorcycle kid found that. And, and, and I think in a bigger way, Captain Eastman found that. Mary Baker Eddy lived that. I mean, when she discovered Christian science, it just became her life motive to, to share. And so I want to talk about her life work, science and health, with Key to the Scriptures, as an example of the outcome of a life of somebody who cared for everybody, you know, to use her words. Science and Health is the uh, textbook of Christian science, and it, together with the Bible, teaches readers to heal themselves and others, and, and even address the liability to danger or disease. Now, there are two different books. Of course, the Bible is a timeless guide that's filled with God's word. It's filled with counseled directly from God, and, and filled with accounts of people having profound experiences with God. Maybe some of you have had that. Science and Health is, uh, well, an explanation of the practicality of the ideas in the Bible. It's often taken a Bible verse or passage or something like that and explained it to me in a way that I can then use that word of God in my life in a practical way. It also talks about how the healing works that took place both in the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament, that type of healing work is possible today. In fact, it said that the last hundred pages of the book are letters that were written by folks who were healed just by reading the ideas in the book. Healed by reading a book. <laughs> how does that happen? You know, as I said, I've been using this phrase, spiritual seekers. And when Science and Health was published, it just was finding its way into the hands of spiritual seekers. And just for some context, I mean, this was the 1800s. Life on the farm was tough. And life in the factory was tough. And I think folks had a lot of reasons to reach out for help. And, and when they would reach out to something higher, when they would look to God, for help, when they would learn something about the nature, the infinite loving nature of God and then their own nature from the pages of science and health, they'd find healing on, on all kinds of levels. And we all can do that. As I said, we, we can all find healing that way. I have um, one more story along those lines that I'd like to share. Um, and it's, it was an example of my, you know, having, having that type of experience that those folks did, finding what God was bringing out in me. In my case, it was um, I was needing to discover a little bit more of my innate decisiveness and strength and clarity and capacity, I think. Um, and when I did that, 
it was there, I just didn't realize it. And when I was able to do that, God brought something out in me that was really worth sharing. So my story takes place when I was in graduate school and I had a rash on my chest that, that had been there way too long. Um, actually, I had been in grad school for a long time. I'd been in grad school so long that my parents started calling it gradual school. And uh, I, I think I'd had this rash since college started, so maybe about five years, and it just didn't want to budge. I mean, sometimes it was inflamed, sometimes it itched. It, it, it sometimes died down a little bit, but it never went away. And I think because of you know, the fact that I could hide it with the right clothes, which I would do, and because it didn't hurt particularly, I didn't really do anything about it. Um, that was also kind of how I was living my life at the time, too. You know, I, I think I hadn't discovered the, the spiritual authority or the, the confidence that comes from God-centered living. Life felt like something that just happened to me, you know, and um, things like giving freely of myself or finding the larger context weren't really on my screen. But I was a young adult. I was starting to develop a relationship with God, and um, I certainly wanted physical healing. I mean, that sounded good. I was praying in my spare time and reading the Bible, reading Science and Health. And one day I came across a line in Science and Health that really meant a lot to me. It said, inflammation, now that's just what I was dealing with, inflammation is fear, an excited state of mortals that is not normal. And I was really struck at how practically, you, you know, we've all had this experience where something kind of jumps off the page at you. I was struck with how practically mathematically that was expressed. I mean, it was like inflammation equals fear. You know, if, if you're inflamed, you're probably afraid. Well, I wasn't afraid, or I didn't think so. But, you know, as I reflected on it a little bit more, I could see times in my life when I was making decisions based on fear. Uh, for example, one big one that I picked up on right away, I would stay in unhealthy relationships too long or have too many of them because I was afraid of navigating life alone and probably afraid of the demand that more productive relationships would put on me. Um, I was in this tough graduate program not because I loved the field but because I was afraid of not getting a good job otherwise. I would even pack too much lunch in the morning because I was afraid of being hungry in the afternoon. Now, when these fears came to the surface, that was helpful to me. Um, I didn't really know what to do with them, but I knew that they weren't helping me. They weren't helping me be a better contributor you know, in my job or, or personal life. That, that idea, that, that suggestion that we can't, you know, that something is holding us back from giving freely of ourselves has a special name, too. You know, I mean, I, and I'm just going to interrupt myself a little bit here to say that we all love the idea of giving freely. I mean, I think it just sounds really good initially. Whatever would hold us back from doing that takes us in the wrong direction. You know, anything that would inhibit our, our natural tendency to give of ourselves isn't from God. And I think, I think it's just that suggestion of feeling inadequate you know, as if we don't have something wonderful within ourselves to share, like, wow, it sounds good. I like what she's talking about, but I don't know if I have something like that in me. You know, but, but I, I'm just discovering that that voice that would say you don't have something in you is what the Bible calls the carnal mind. You know, and it's just a, a noisy, unhelpful mentality, you know, that's based on the belief that something other than God impels our lives. But we've talked about this already. I mean, God is spirit, and we're spiritual. And so that means rather than something like chance or luck, it's God, spirit, and qualities of spirit that impel us forward. And I know it can feel kind of appropriate to shrink back a little bit from the qualities. I mean, we might feel a little bit reticent to wholeheartedly identify ourselves as, you know, complete and spiritual, and athletic, and beautiful, and perfect. 
But if we shrink back from that, we're really shrinking back from the promise of expressing and experiencing, that's the word I want, experiencing all those qualities in our lives. And when we embrace the promise, when we embrace that invitation, we discover more of that abundant living that Christ Jesus was talking about. And so that was kind of the, the transition that I was needing to make there. I mean, I, I discovered when those fears came to the surface, I discovered that that was the carnal mind mentality, you know, making my life or trying to make my life small and my focus on myself. But the carnal mind is not intelligent. I mean, it's not like I took this reasonable assessment of my life, thought about what my demands were and thought, yep, it's too hard, I can't do it. You know, I mean, I wasn't inadequate. Fear was making me feel inadequate. And I think when, when I finally realized that, just that clicked in me, and I immediately thought of that Bible verse that maybe many of you know that says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Well, that, that hit the spot. You know, the only perfect love I knew was God's love. I mean, it's just so encouraging. It's just the opposite of that carnal mind discouragement. It's, God's love is encouraging and abundant and empowering. And so I, I thought about how could I see God's love expressed throughout my day? I mean, I started with myself. It, it wasn't hard, you know, um, seeing God's love for me. I was a grad student. I had this cute little apartment. It wasn't fancy, but it was clean. It was safe. It was near campus. I, I liked that. Um, I had a good job. Again, it was not particularly lucrative, but it was putting me through grad school. I was gr grateful for that. I had family and friends nearby. All of that just showed me just the, the natural abundance of God's love in my life. And then I could kind of expand that and just see God's love for creation in things like, again, um, seeing selfless acts in the grocery store or something like that, or the sound of little kids playing. That's the best. Don't you love that? You know, I mean, that they're laughing because life is good. They're not thinking about themselves at all. Their laughter is just like music that just kind of uplifts the world, you know. And so I would see little kids on my way to campus in the morning and just love that. So all of that just made it really clear to me that, that God was present in my life and, and filling my life with love. And that lifted my outlook on my whole experience. I mean, I certainly felt safer, but I also felt stronger. You know, I felt capable to be a force for good in this good creation that I was part of. You know, and I, there was a shift there. I mean, I could feel myself going from victim to healer. And, and that, that empowered me to think about, you know, ask myself some, some tough questions. Okay, am I in this relationship to give freely of myself? Or am I trying to keep myself safe in a too small life? Am I in this graduate program to give to the field? Or am I trying to get just the right professor's name on my resume so I can get a job? And you know, once I asked those questions, I realized that I could answer them and adjust, adjust my life if I needed to. And to my amazement, I mean, that, that, that mental activity, that prayerful activity just gave me the confidence to leave these unhealthy relationships. That would have seemed just unthinkable even a week or two earlier. I mean, it was who I was, I thought, you know, but, but I found a new identity. I mean, I found a, I found a truer identity. Um, I didn't leave my graduate program, but I tweaked it a little bit. I found an area of the field that I could give to more freely. And instead of trying to chase this one professor in my department, I, um, I found somebody else to work with. And she and I had a really fruitful year as I wrote my dissertation. And our results were so good and, and reliable, the, the research committee, the research community quoted them for, for years afterwards. So that was really fruitful. And I think my eating habits even got better during this time. So about a week or two after I had had all this, you know, spiritual mental growth, I mean, just really discovering the joy of giving more of myself. And again, I probably wouldn't have used that exact terminology or language to describe it, but that's what was going on. When I found that joy, in, in caring for everybody a little bit more. Um, I was changing my clothes one day and I realized that the rash was completely gone. The skin was clean and clear. 
all signs of inflammation, all signs of fear really were gone. I mean, that rash had not budged for five years. And then when I just opened up thought a little bit more to experiencing more of God's qualities, you know, decisiveness and love, um, strength, I found healing. I even started getting prayer requests during this time, which, which was really you know, fulfilling to me, something I had wanted to do. There is such healing power in this approach of giving freely of ourselves. You know? But it, it's quiet work. I don't think anybody knew I was praying for myself. They saw a transformation in me. You know, they didn't know the physical healing I had maybe, but they, they certainly saw uh, some type of transformation in me. It's, it's you and God working out something, something wonderful that then grows into something that the community or, or wider circles appreciate. You know, as I said, I, I think thinking good thoughts, being kind to one another, um, that was all really important to me in this experience. Foundational, I think. But I bet everybody here is kind of already doing that. You know, I mean, what really was transformational, what really made the difference for me was facing fears and then giving my consent to experience more of God's qualities. So I just want to thank you all for staying with me till the end here, finding this unexpected way forward. Jesus keeps being our, our best model. We can keep asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? And Mary Baker Eddy's life work, Science and Health, will give you the tools and the understanding needed to bless and to be blessed. There's so much good going on here. We have more in us than we realize. We have everything we need to give freely and to gain all. Thank you all. You know, I spoke a few times about this book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, and I forgot to ask Jennifer, do we have copies of it? Okay, so there, there, if you don't have a copy, I, I highly recommend it. They, there's a table out in the hall that has this and the Bible and, and other stuff. You can talk to an usher, too. Have a great afternoon.